Good morning, everyone, as we are back again for another uh, look into Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And uh, this class is going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit different, um, at least for in my mind anyways, uh, because uh, I know last week I had, I had mentioned that you uh, to read beginning in chapter, verse 13, chapter 5 and verse 13 through the end of the chapter. Well, um, as I was studying and as I was writing notes and take, writing things down, um, I, I got about halfway through what the, the verses that I told you to read, and I was already pretty much at my max notes uh, for a you know reasonably linked class. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to split this class up. We're going to talk from verse thirteen, and we're going to go through verse twenty-one. Uh, if I remember right, uh, should, yes, and verse twenty-one, uh, which goes through the works of the flesh. Uh, and then uh, coming back next week, we will start in verse 22, which will be the, the fruits of the Spirit, and, uh, and going through the end of the chapter, which there's plenty there to be able to, uh, to cover a class. And, so, and then after that class, we will have two more classes uh, that we'll finish out for this, uh, this quarter uh, for our east sides, uh, con- our congregation east side, uh, for our quarter classes. And then after that, I don't know uh, what we'll be uh, doing after that, um, but we will definitely have something going on so we can continue classes no matter how, um, if we are still not meeting for class, we will, well, I'm sure we will definitely be putting something out for everybody to be able to study. Uh, either way, there's a lot of good stuff out there for it to, to hunt. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, don't mind Tracy. We were we were having a, a a long discussion prior to this, and he decided to tell me that I was in teaching out of Philippians right before class started, and uh, and I'm oh, great. I'm mean, that's all I'm going to talk about now is Philippians. So if I say Philippians when I'm meant to say Galatians, I apologize. It's Tracy's fault. So um, so let's go ahead and and, and get started. So uh, as we uh, to, as a reminder to where we were uh, last week, Paul has been extolling freedom, uh, the idea of freedom through Christ, and he's made it clear. That anyone who turns their back from freedom uh, to the law is both ungrateful, they're, they're unwise, and, and he pretty much goes on to say just theologically wrong uh, in, in what they're doing. Uh, now, Paul is going to help his readers to, to try to grasp what this newfound freedom uh, looks like and how they should not misuse this freedom, and this is where we're going to get into these works of the flesh or, or vices, as many will say. And, and, and this, this, this freedom comes with responsibility. It, is, uh, it should produce people who get along better with other people uh, and do better things. It should produce people who are selfless, not selfish. Uh, and that's going to be a very contrasting idea uh, whenever we see, uh, again, the, the works of the flesh versus the fruits of the spirits. Uh, the spirit, this is someone who is selfless versus someone, or selfless versus someone who is selfish. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and move into the, the next few verses. This is uh, verse 13. We're going to read 13 through 15 uh, as we, uh, we get to the last of this little section, uh, this part of chapter 5. It said, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Now, the conjunction here for uh, introduces the idea uh, of what Paul was talking about in prior. If you look back to, to verse 12, that was that very harsh statement uh, that, he, uh, that Paul calls for an imp- uh, imprecation or, or a curse on the Judaizers um, for what they were doing. And so he's now going to talk about why uh, he was calling for that, that they were attempting to lead the Galatians away from their newfound freedom in Christ and that they were, uh, they were trying to pull them back into a bondage under the law. You know, Paul insisted that the Galatians had been called to be free and that they were therefore should stay free, that the Galatians, the, excuse me, the Judaizers had no right to try to take them away from that, to, to call the churches in Galatia or any church, any of God's churches, uh, a congregation, uh, to, to move away from that freedom back to the, to the law, to the, to the law that in Paul's words equaled slavery. Furthermore, Paul was well aware of how dangerous this freedom could be, especially for in ancient Greek and Roman culture. We're talking about the Galatians here who live in a very Hellenistic or uh, Greek-based culture in one of the Roman provinces, uh, one of the Roman provinces. So uh, they would have been very, very difficult for them, and he would have very much understood the the dangers that this freedom that they now have uh, would have. Um, uh, would have caused for them. So he knew the tendency of a the unspiritual man to turn freedom 
into a license to, to, for sin. And he understood that. And he was hoping that to clarify that salvation by God's grace through man's faith prohibits a Christian to live immorally. And so and it's, we, this, this belief only uh, kind of Christianity, that this is something you can't do, that, that God does not accept that. So Paul is going to counsel his readers to remember that there are more important things than self-indulgence, that he calls on them to serve one another and that to do this through love. Uh, the previous statement, uh, whenever he talks about through love, um, this is a fulfillment of the law. Uh, the, the law, uh, unfortunately, provided very little power to reform a life. The idea, uh, the ideal, though, uh, had indeed been um, enunciated or, or spoken about in the law. Um, the two greatest commands uh, were there. Jesus had said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and, and so, um, but the, however, the, the new covenant, the gospel, is what gave the power to renew or to, uh, to reform your life and, and do it through love. Uh, Paul's going to say in Romans and, and chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so this love is what is going to give us the ability to reform ourselves and also to be able to express, as he would go on to talk about, the fruits of the Spirit uh, that, that, are, that are given to us. So this is why Paul focused on this great love commandment here, that it is for this, this, this Christian virtue um, his Galatian brethren were falling very far short of. They, they, they seemed to be, uh, that they were falling short of that virtue that the Spirit was supposed to be, that would, would lead them through. So in, in verse 15, this is the, uh, the, the first time that we understand that there is a very, um, there's a clear indication there's a very serious interpersonal problem going on in Galatia, that there was, there was something going on with the brethren in the, the churches there. Um, the, uh, the language used here is, is, is pretty strict and pretty serious. Uh, the Greek word here, when it uses the word bite, um, that's only, it's only, uh, the only time it's used here in the New Testament, it's used quite often in the Old Testament. Whenever you look at the Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, um, they, they use the same word there, and it's most often referred to of the bite of a serpent. Uh, also, if you look in at the end of verse 15, it says consumed by one another. Um, that word is only used uh, twice in the New Testament, once here and then once in Luke 9, verse 54. And in this case, it's talking about being consuming fi- the consuming fire from heaven. So these are some very, obviously there's some serious problems here, some serious issues that were going on. And now we don't know what those problems were. Um, it's possible that he is referring to the maybe two different groups uh, two different uh, sections or factions, as, as we might say, have, have developed uh, maybe with the Judaizers and other brethren who are, who are trying to preach the truth. Um, we don't know uh, as to what the actual problems were. But what we do know is that there was, this was destroying love. It was destroying, that it was disfellowshipping uh, the people in Galatia. And so Paul is, is making it very clear here why it is important uh, to love each other. And he's going to go on, and, and if, you, if you really, as we move forward, especially with the, in the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, he, he focuses on a lot of, uh, of unity ideas, especially on the works of the flesh and how disunity is so incredibly dangerous. In any case, uh, the time had come for Paul to, to kind of close his doctrinal position at this portion of his letter. And he's going to move on to the more practical application. Uh, so now we're going to look into uh, the, the walking by the Spirit uh, kind of section of this. And we're going to start in verse 16. We're going to read through 16 through 18 and then talk about that for just a second. And this is to begin uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, excuse me, let me stop there. And so, and again, one thing I wanted to point out very quickly, if you, again, we look at the very end of verse 18, where he, he brings back in to the law, that if you are walking in the spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so he, he brings that point back in again. Now, Paul is very conscious of the fact that it is, that a Christian life is not an easy life. It, it, it is not, it is something difficult that you must strive and work for and work towards every day. Human nature 
being what it is, it is is always tempted. It's always being tempted to do things that we should not do and to leave undone the things that we should do. And, and Paul is begging the Galatians to be aware of this conflict and to be aware that the Holy Spirit is always guiding, always strengthening. Um, uh, Leon Morris said this, and I thought this was a really good quote. He says, The apostle will not let us forget that the Christian life must be lived and can be lived. But it can be lived only as the Spirit directs and empowers. And I thought it was a great way of saying that, that, that what Paul is presenting here is how incredibly important it is that uh, we follow what the Spirit is directing us to do. So we move on to, move on to verse 16. Uh, Paul has already, um, uh, already warned the Galatians against turning freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. And so now he is instructing them, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But by submitting to the will of the Holy Spirit, you would avoid yielding to, to sinful passions. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, for me, it is, it is so often that I think, you know, it would have been so much easier for me to, to, to bypass the temptation or, or so much easier to, to move away from that situation if I would have just listened to what God was trying to tell me to do. And, and, and so often I try to do it myself and, and it never works. And, and, and so this is what Paul is saying. Don't, don't quit trying to do this yourself. Listen to the Spirit. He will guide you in the right ways. It is important. It also important to remember this. And I thought this was a really good point by uh, by a, 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 an author that I read. It said the Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ, all of which are found in Scripture, are all one and the same in these verses. So keep this in mind. It's very important as Christians to remember that we have the Spirit of God in us. And that he will guide us, that he, we can walk by the Spirit. The term walk here, uh, in the phrase walk by, the, walk by the Spirit, literally means go about. And so those who would walk in the way of the Spirit are, are endowed or given this, this, uh, an effective method of resisting temptation. If you're walking in the way of the Spirit, if you're walking in the way of God, you are going to be ever given the ability to avoid temptation and to overcome sin every time. So Paul elaborates on the spiritual battle that rages for all Christians in verse 17. And he, he elaborates that or he, he, uh, these, these, uh, in his, his writings where he says that um, this was being written to, to all, uh, to the Christians there and to all of us though, that we must constantly, again, he is writing that we must constantly fight against sinful passions. That the, the spirit is totally opposed to the flesh. That everything about what the flesh wants, the spirit as opposed to. The Holy Spirit is active in promoting all sorts of goodness. And it is impossible for the spirit to countenance the things the flesh strives for. On the other hand, the spirit and the flesh are in opposite, opposition to one another. What the flesh so passionately wants, the spirit rejects outright. Again, a great way of saying that. The, uh, the flesh is concerned with the basic drives of life, the, the basic things that, that, that we want in life. But the Spirit is concerned with something far greater, the ultimate and, the, the ultimate and heavenly realities that, that are, are, are to come. That is what the Spirit is looking for, something that is down the road. The, the, the flesh is looking for right now. The Spirit is thinking about the future. Finally, Paul once again, draw, as we already stated, he's going to draw his, his readers back to the focal point of everything that he has talked about in his letter already. Back to the, the freedom from the law, freedom from slavery of the law. Okay, so now let's go ahead and, and read through. Now we're going to read through the deeds of the, or the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. And this is uh, verse 19 through verses 21. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we're going to, for the rest of this class, we are going to go through and we're going to look at these, uh, these words. Now, I, I kind of went back and forth as to how I wanted to, to talk about this. And we thought about, thought about maybe doing like an overall encompassing idea, but it really didn't fit the spirit of what I've been doing in this class so far. And so what I wanted to do was, is I, I kind of want to walk through each word individually. And we'll do this again next week with the fruits of the spirit, which will be a much more uplifting uh, class than this one. But, uh, but we are going to look through each one of these individually because I, what I want to do is talk about the different translations. 
translations for each word that your different Bibles might have, and uh, and kind of what what we think Paul was really getting at uh, with this. What was he really trying to tell us? Uh, with each one of these and because sometimes we often just read through those and be like okay yeah that's not me and move on where the reality is that we like anything in the scriptures we need to stop and really pay attention to each individual word to find out what exactly is was the spirit directing Paul to tell us so uh, he's going to elaborate on the the contrast between the the flesh and the spirit. So he he continues this with a as we just read a kind of a vice list as many people will say. Um, these are common lists. They're commonly found in scripture. Uh, to where lists are, they're, they're, they tend to range from a, a number of different uh, points. Uh, obviously, as I said before, Paul's letter to the Galatians here. He his works. Uh, of the flesh, a lot of them center around the idea of division and, 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 and fractions in the church. At least a number of them do. And so he's obviously kind of focusing on that a little bit. Um, but he's going to begin this with a kind of a preamble a little bit uh, where he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Now the word we want to look at there is the word evident. Uh, and it's the, this can be translated to mean visible, clear, and plainly to be seen. Now, in other words, what Paul is saying is these are observable actions. These are things that you people are actively doing in their life. Uh, one commentator wrote, and, and I, I thought it was, a, it was an interesting way of looking at this, that there is a marked difference between someone who is living by the Spirit, who, uh, who falls into temptation, as we all do. Every, all of us uh, stand and fall short of the glory of God. But there's a marked difference between that person and someone who is living by the flesh. And, 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 there, and it's, it's important to, to understand that. And so he is talking about works of the flesh are evident. These are, this is how you're living your life. Uh, also, another commentator said that Paul was showing that unspiritual vices and spiritual virtues are discernible. There's an obvious difference between the two. And uh, if you're trying to guide the, the line there is one of, uh, one of our elders says quite often, you know, that I, I've heard, um, you know, why, why stand anywhere near the line? And get as far away from the line as you can. You know, don't, don't tread on the line and hope that you don't fall to the other side. Get as far away from the line as you possibly can. Don't make sure that your, your fruits of the Spirit are distinguishable, are discernible from the, the, the works of the flesh. So now the works of the flesh can be divided into to multiple groups. Now, uh, reading through a number of different readings and commentators and, and other things, uh, everybody kind of has their own take as to how you divide these up. Um, for the most part, though, uh, you, what we're going to look at, for my purposes, we're going to look at these in basically four groups. Okay, so first we have, uh, there's the first three are sexual sins. The next two are pagan ritual sins. The next eight are when this is one that is often broken into uh, sometimes threes and fours. We're going to just put it all together in eight in interpersonal relationships. And then uh, the last the last two are going to be riotous living. And, and so, and again, um, and so the, uh, and again, that it just, it, it, it works better for the way I was kind of wanting to, to uh, present this. So if you broke in a different group, there, there's no right or wrong way to do it. So since we're going to be looking at, at both of these, uh, the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit in this class, we're going to kind of do it the same way. Uh, we're going to go through each individual word, like I've already said before, and we're going to kind of look at uh, the, the phrase, and we're going to look at possible different translations, and, and kind of what Paul meant by these, like I said before. So um, now as we get started, I, I want to make sure that there's something you're thinking about. Keep this in your mind. Keep this in your back of your mind as we're talking about this. And this is one of the most important, in my opinion, one of the most important phrases that you always keep in your mind, whenever you're studying, when you're thinking, especially when you're thinking about yourself, where is your heart at? Okay, so think about that. When we're looking at these words, where is your heart at? That's one of the most important things that you can, uh, that you can keep in mind as you're looking through these, especially in the works of the flesh. So let's start out. This is the kind of the middle of uh, verse 19, and we're going to look at sexual sins. And this is going to be sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. So the first one, sexual immorality. Now, again, I said we're going to look at different translations. So uh, your your version could be uh, could be a, a translated as adultery. Uh, it could just be an a just immorality, not sexual immorality, but just immorality. Fornication is another translation. Now, uh, this word has kind of become something of a euphemism for just to refer to sexually indecent behavior in general. In fact, the Greek word that is used here uh, is is predominantly covers just a variety of kind of what, they, what we call sexual sins. Uh, and so it does kind of have an all over encompassing idea. So to put it simply, according to uh, put it simply, and this is the way we want to look at this scripture tells us very clearly that sexual activity is something that is acceptable and pleasing to God 
that takes place between a husband and a wife. Okay? So anything outside of that is where we start delving into the idea of sexual immorality. Um, now, we know that, especially in our culture today, and, and, and again, and, and this was a conversation Tracy and I were having quite a bit uh, prior to this class, is that it's always important to remember that um, to, to not allow yourself to get wrapped up and say, well, you know, America today. No, 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 no. The, the Greek, the Galatians were dealing with the exact same problems of the idea of, uh, you know, husband and wife. That's the only place you can keep sexual activity. They, that, that, this would have been something that you were keeping. There has been an issue that would have been global. And this is nothing new. Um, in the United States, yes, it is definitely a resurgence here. That This is something that we, a lot of people in our country today do not necessarily agree with. But here's the important thing to remember. We are not concerned with what people think. We are concerned with what God thinks. Okay, and it's important to always keep that in mind. So moving on, impurity. Now, this one actually in the Greek word literally means uncleanliness um, is what it's talking about. Now, we're obviously, we're not talking about uh, you know dirt or, or physical hygiene here, and that, that's not what we're talking about. Um, it, it is uh, used figuratively often to refer to moral corruption or impure motives. Um, especially whenever it is connected with, uh, with, with sexual sins, which is, it often is. Um, basically, what we're looking at is the impurity is the idea of unnatural vices. So something that would be considered unnatural. And so if you're connecting with sexual sins, which is in the case we are here, we're talking about things that would, not, would, would be more of the unnatural idea. Um, and, and so and we'll, we'll, um, and we'll leave with that. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> He said, "Way to be vague." If you're not, if you didn't hear that, so um, and again with most of these, and just to clarify, with most of these words, we're, we're not going to get in too much detail in these. We could spend a lot of time on all of this. I felt like I'm already spending a lot of time on these in general. We could spend a lot of time, and so we um, we'll, we'll we'll move on. Impure. Uh, excuse me. The next one is sensuality. Now I'm reading from the the English Standard Version is where my translation is, so yours may be different. Uh, this can also translated, and I apologize if I if I say these wrong: uh, debauchery, uh, li- lasciviousness, licentiousness, indecency, or vice. These are all different translations that you will see. Um, all of them um, work pretty well, and this one typically refers to. Uh, excessive sexual activity. This is the um, is what it typically involves in um, the the this and this is this is and that's more of the the Greek translation idea. the The best way to look at it more of an English idea is where you give yourself over completely to lust. That's the probably the the most appropriate way to look at it in the English term. Um, it is kind of where that is that that wording seems to fall in in, in the Greek idea. Okay, so moving on, let's look into pagan ritual sins. Now, there's going to be two here, idolatry and sorcery. And this is about, this is beginning and kind of middle of of, uh, chapter 5 and verse 20. Now, idolatry, this is a word that uh, there's really not any other translations for this. It is something, it's a very common term used both the Old Testament and the New Testament and and Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And and it's it's pretty, it really does need a lot of uh, explanation. It is important to always note, though, that idolatry, especially today, does not necessarily have to represent a a supposed deity. And idolatry can be anything that comes before God. And so uh, and you can make an idol of. And so, you know, we hear often today in our culture, in our country, we talk about, you know, putting, you know, uh, sports or entertainment or your education or anything that you do that you put in front of God can become your idol and, and, and something that you put more of a uh, on a higher plane. And so it's important to remember that. Uh, and one thing I thought was interesting is I was reading through all these and studying. I want you to, uh, to think about this. Could you not, in some way, add idolatry to almost every one, if not every one, of these works of the flesh? That the idea of that these each one of these could become your idol. It could be something that you put in front of God. And I think that's an interesting uh, way. So I think idolatry is definitely one. It, it is so often used, and, and, and rightfully so, and importantly so. Um, but it is. I think that's a, one of the more important of this list. The next one is sorcery. Now this one we're going to, uh, to spend a little bit more time on because I, uh, through studying, I found some interesting stuff on this that I think you might be interested in, you might like. But first of all, this is often, t- most of the translations just use sorcery or witchcraft, one of the two. And the idea of witchcraft is, is something we're going to talk about a little bit. Now, 
Um, the, there's a lot of different words that are either he, used here or related to this word. There's different Greek verbs. There's other words that are very similar that all kind of lump into one general idea. So let me give you some of the different Greek, the translations in the Greek. Now, these aren't necessarily translations used in, in this verse. They almost always use either sorcery or witchcraft. But to give you a better understanding of what exactly it means, administer, administer of drug or medicine, use enchantments, practice sorcery, drug a person with poison, a sorcerer who practices magic, also just magic, magic potion, or witchcraft. These are all words that are all kind of lumped into one general idea in the Greek language, and, and they all kind of, they all work uh, on some level. Now, most of these words have a very negative connotation to them, but a few, a couple of them actually, like, for example, um, administrator of drugs and medicine um, for this. Now, for those of you that don't know, I did not know this. This was new to me, but this is where we get the word pharmacist from. So if you're a pharmacist out there, I'm sorry, um, but, but there is, there's definitely a new side of that. So uh, the question might come up though, then how in the world do we associate a pharmacist with witchcraft? Well, there's, there's, that's, that's kind of the discussion. First of all, there's a couple of things you need to understand is that from the first century and for centuries prior to that, especially in the Greek language, but in any language, the idea of even a therapeutic drug, a, a medicine, people would not have understood why it worked. They just knew it worked. And so they would have associated that with magic of some level or possibly. So the person who was administering, like a physician, a person who was administering that type of drug or that type of medicine or a therapeutic anything might also be considered someone who was a doc, like a, a, a magician or a sorcerer. For example, a witch doctor, which is an English version of, uh, of someone who gives, like in a native uh, village or something, who is kind of the, 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 the uh, holds a lot of different roles, but obviously medicine is one of them. Um, but then we also, in the English term, we typically add the word witch to it. Um, and that, so you can see that combination there. Today, we obviously separate the two, but at the time, they didn't. It didn't necessarily make any of them good or bad. The important idea to remember this, though, and this is something that this is a point we're going to bring in a couple of times, is that it is very important not to add to the words that are in this list. We don't want to add things to it to add to, to make it mean more than what it actually does. All right, to give you an example, um, I have uh, someone in, that in my life uh, many years ago, um, whenever, right about the time that the, um, the, the Harry Potter series came out of books, okay, um, that came out. And I had asked uh, this person if they wanted to have, uh, maybe they would have their, their, their son read it. And they told me, oh, no, 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 I won't read that because it has to do with witchcraft. Okay, I, I, could, I can see where that's coming from. I understand where you, where you get that from. But this person also, uh, not too many months later, was also then telling their kid about how Santa Claus was magical. Okay, it's very important to remember what the premise is, is what Paul was getting at. Okay, obviously translations here will use the word rich, witchcraft. But the idea here is that what Paul was talking about was the looking for otherworldly things to be able to give you powers that God can give you. Right? Perfect example of this would be Simon the Sorcerer. He was looking for otherworldly powers to add to his repertoire. He was looking for something beyond. Uh, he was looking for something extra. The, the problem is, is that Paul doesn't want us going to look for some otherworldly power. If we have a medicine and we can use that, we don't need to, we don't go looking for this otherworldly power to see why that medicine worked. We know that it's a creation of God's and it's his power is what has given us that healing effect. And so that's what he is saying. This idea of looking for sorcery, looking for this witchcraft, is, is not going out looking for these otherworldly powers, that that is the wrong idea. And if you go back to the Old Testament, that is a very similar concepts there. Okay, moving on. The next one is enmity. Also translated hostility or hatred. It is related to the Greek word meaning enemy or one who is hated. So that one's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, basically what we're talking about here is animosity that may arise from, from rivalry or, or envy, um, resentment, abuse, anything that has caused us to, to just simply not like someone. And we, we turn that into a hatred or hostility. In other words, we're not forgiving. And that's what Paul is saying is to don't make sure that you are forgiving. The next one is strife. Uh, yours may translate it discord, variance, and or quarreling uh, is another one you might see. Um, this would have been especially important 
to the Church of Galatia. This is our first example of this, this kind of separated idea. Enmity, you could probably train, get put into that. But this separation that the, the, the churches in Galatia seem to be suffering through. Uh, it, it is Paul's desire was to keep discord and quarreling out of the churches. He did not want the, the brethren living in any way except for in peace and harmony. And, and so it's important that, uh, so he, he adds that, that we do not want this, this quarreling between uh, people in the church or, or quarreling in general, someone who goes out looking for the argument. The next one is jealousy. Now, jealousy is one that's kind of interesting because as we'll see later, there's going to be other words in here that are going to uh, have more of the maybe severe version of jealousy, you might say. Um, but in this one, uh, you might also see it translated as emulations. Um, but this ca- it carries with the idea, the Greek term here carries with the idea of kind of a burning passion of jealousy. Now, the interesting way is that, in a, I, I could be wrong, you Greek scholars out there, you can correct me if I, if I am wrong, but I believe the way this was read was that this word could be used in both a positive and a negative manner. In the positive manner, it would basically be kind of the idea of intense positive interest, like zeal. Um, like really, really being uh, wanting something. On the other hand, the negative side would be intense negative feeling over someone else's success or achievements. And this would be the idea of jealousy. Um, I, again, if, I, if I'm wrong on that in the Greek, I, I think that's the way that I read that. But this one is directed towards selfish, fleshly desires of the heart. You see something, you want it, and you let it burn passion in you that you just really want it. And that's something that you're maybe even willing to do something underhanded in order to obtain it. The next one in my translation says fits of anger. Now other translations are going to say outbursts of anger, fits of rage, wrath. There's also anger and then there's also, I found one that said ill-tempered. Now most of these translations work just fine, but I I think what Paul is getting at here was more that the fits or outbursts of anger or fits of rage um, wrath, maybe and I think is really what he is going for here is that you're you're not just ill tempered. When I see ill tempered, what I see is bad mood. <laughs> um, being in a bad mood is not a sin, right? It is not bad to be in a bad mood, right? However, if that bad mood turns into a fit of anger, if a fit of rage, wrathfulness towards someone else, or whatever, that is where the problem sets in. Everybody wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Sometimes, you know, you don't have your morning cup of coffee. Now, that does not excuse you from turning this into something on this list. But that's why I wasn't very, I didn't really like the idea of just ill-tempered. I, I, I felt like that was a, it wasn't quite what Paul was trying to get at. Um, now, the next one is rivalries. Now, this one is also translated self-ambition, strife, disputes, selfishness. Uh, the word appears to have involved rivalry and trying to gain a personal advantage over others. In other words, you have someone that you are constantly competing with and you're always trying to get the better of them. Now, it's hard to say which one of these works because of these different translations, one side seems to be more on the selfishness side. The other one seems to, seems to be more on the dispute side. So which side are we looking? Is it your selfish desire to just be better than them or is it the argument it's hard to say. I, I think they both work. I, I tend to fall more towards the selfish desire idea that you that it seemed to that seemed to be make more sense. That uh, you have this selfish desire to to want to promote yourself, to be better, to to uh, at the expense of other people. Um, you know whether that be selfishness or, or selfish disputes of the congregation. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I guess both of them work. But again, I think all of it tends to fall more into the selfishness idea, which seems to fall more into what Paul was talking about with the Galatians. Um, let's see. And then next one is dissensions. Now, this one is also translated sedition or division. Um, and there is little doubt as to how dangerous dissension can be. Uh, Romans 16, 17, it refers to those who cause dissension or cause divisions. And this was so serious that it, it talks about that those who committed are to be avoided, that they are subject to church discipline and excluded from the fellowship of the saints. And so someone who, who intentionally causes division. And there's an important one here too, is that it's, it's important to remember that we're not talking about, um, uh, someone who simply has a group of friends over here. It is someone who is actively looking to divide, actively looking to uh, this dissension or, or uh, this sedition idea uh, with, um, with with the other people. They're, act- they're actively uh, looking to do that. 
And the next one of my translation says divisions. Now this one might say factions. Uh, I did find one that said party spirit. That was a little odd. Um, it is odd. It's not really, it'll make sense here in a second. But one of them, uh, translation actually, I think it's the King James actually says heresies. Um, I thought it was interesting. But then I, when I started doing some research, I found out that this word, the Greek word here, is actually where we get the word heresy from. And where that comes from is that whenever, eventually, when the church would believe that someone would start preaching something against what the church was preaching, in this case we're talking predominantly in the Catholic church, when they were pre someone was preaching, this group was standing up and preaching against the Catholic church, they would accuse them of heresy. In reality, they were dividing the church. That's, where, that's how we get that connection there. I never knew that, so that was very interesting. Um, your translations may use the word faction. That's actually a very common word uh, used in this, uh, this idea, um, something that was used uh, even in the first century uh, to, um, to simply designate two different groups. Uh, that was actually very common. And so um, this was something that probably would have been a little bit confusing maybe to the Galatians because they would have seen that the, their word, it would have been like, well, so there's two different groups of people. Why is that bad? But when it, since Paul is adding it to this list, he is pointing out the fact that we are meant to be united. We're meant to be one congregation, one church, one body. Um, it, just a little bit more about the, the word faction. Uh, that was used uh, even in the United States. We, that was how, especially the early founding fathers, used the word faction to designate political parties. And so, um, of which George Washington said we shouldn't have any. I think we should go back and believe that again. So. Sect, yes, 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 no, no one there um, would also fall with that. So um, to quote uh, Jack McKinney on the idea of factions, I thought this was interesting. Uh, factions are a work of the flesh that is diametrically opposed to the spirit. In later times, the word developed the primary meaning of doctrinal error, error, which is conveyed by the English word heresy. So a little bit more of a description there. I thought you'd be interested. The next one is envy. Now also translated as spite. Um, this one is the one that is very similar to jealousy. Now, but the difference is, is that this one in the Greek term tends to convey so whenever your jealousy turns to your want to harm someone. Your envy has turned so bad, this green with envy, that you have literally gone to the point of uh, anger and rage and you're, you're willing to go take it to the next step. If you have the King James Version, you may notice that in most of the King James Versions, not all of them, but of most of them, it will add the word murderers after envy. It says envyings, actually. Um, what's interesting that is that a lot of people believe that they, they connect, they added that to show that that word was a, an extreme version of jealousy. It was where you would even take your jealousy to the point of murder. Um, which I thought was an interesting idea. Um, now, so did you, um, did you notice how many times we dealt with the word division and quarreling or some, some way of the church splitting apart? Paul is making it very clear, especially as Christians, one of the most dangerous things we can do is be divided. And we have to be one in the body of Christ. And, and he, has, he has obviously gone over that over and over and over again in many different ways. So obviously this is a very important thing. So we have two more here. Uh, we have uh, for riotous living. Uh, one is drunkenness, and then the other one is orgies. Now, drunkenness is one that we're actually going to spend a little bit of time on, too, kind of like we did with sorcery, um, because this is another one that has an example of uh, why it is important to not add things to a word. Now, the translation here, there are no other translations, at least not that I could find, um, that uh, for the word drunkenness, everyone uses that word. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the, 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 there's, no, there, there's no debate as to what the Greek word means here. It, it's pretty much straightforward. But it is, it is important that we realize something, that this word is based on the idea of drunkenness or excessive drinking. It is not dealing with the idea of abstention. Okay? It is not something where it is, uh, it, it is not a, a way to be able to go in and say, this is where it says we don't drink. Okay? That, that doesn't say that here. What Paul is dealing with here is the idea of drunkenness. Okay? So, and again, this is another example of why we don't want to add to, uh, to, that, to that word. Now, so um, it, it, as I was reading through commentaries and stuff, it, it is, um, I, I thought it was interesting because almost every commentator I read took a second and stopped and went back and, and kind of looked at this word a little bit more thoroughly. And, and, and some of the things that they almost, I, I'm pretty much sure everyone brought up was then, was then, then how do we address the idea of drinking? What, what do we say about that? Now, we're not going to get into this in any kind of real kind of detail. This isn't a lesson about that. But I wanted to do just a little bit of things that I read, that I found from them, which I thought was very interesting. 
Um, now, uh, and just on a side note, I know some people will talk about how, well, you know, this is a different um, idea here because, you know, we talk about that in, um, in the first century or at least in, in Judea, um, that what they were drinking was not wine, that it was, it was grape juice, thing like that. Here's the thing. We're, we're, again, we're not, we're not going to get into an argument debate about that kind of stuff. We're not going to discuss that kind of thing. The important thing to remember here is that we're not talking about Judea. We're not talking about Israel. We're talking about Galatia. Galatia was a Hellenistic province of the Roman Empire. They were very much ensconced in that idea. And so they would, this was very much about the idea of wine and, and alcoholic drinks. It also is important to know that in Greek culture, they did not, they, it was typically considered um, inappropriate to drink full, uh, full body wine. It was meant to be deadened down for a lot of reasons, typically health reasons, um, but it was a typically one part wine to three parts water, which is why you can get the idea of excessive drinking and, and drunkenness and things like that. It would, you would have, this, this is kind of where Paul is going to with this. So, uh, so it's important to to remember that. So, but again, what we're talking about here is excessive drinking, not abstention. So again, let's go back to the question I had before. Uh, now that we've said that, how what do we talk about whenever it comes to to drinking? Well, in some of the things that I've read, and I, I think I'm guessing uh, many of you out there probably already know this, and this is probably one of the best ways uh, to at least open up a conversation with this uh, when someone asks about drinking. If you uh, if you go to Romans 14, verses 20 through 21, uh, Paul is going to say this, is, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Also, he again in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 through 33, says, whether, eat, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. For just as I also please all men in all things, not sinking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. The important thing here to remember is that it is our responsibility to think about what we are doing and what it, how it can affect those around us and what it can mean uh, it, it, to kind of um, it, what that can mean to other people. Um, let me read another quote from, uh, from Jack McKinney because I thought he did a much better way than I can of trying to sum this up. It says, For a believer to give offense by any behavior that may cause someone to fall into sin is no small matter. It is quite possible to engage in a practice which is inherently acceptable and yet, due to a given situation, may be spiritually destructive to, in, to another person. In these circumstances, engaging in such an activity constitutes a terrible sin against the Lord and thwarts His very purpose for coming into the world. I thought that was a very good way of describing that, of that idea. To kind of sum up it, kind of why we delved into that one a little bit more and why we delved into to, to source for a little bit more, it's very important that we don't add to what this, this is saying. Uh, the point is, is that if someone asks you, you know, uh, why do you not drink? And you, you say, well, and you go here and you point out the word drunk and it's just, that's why. That, that's, that's dangerous to do that because you're adding to what Paul was actually saying. There are other verses that you can definitely go to to help answer that question. Um, but that is important to not do that. And, I, and I, I challenge you in this way. If you go to those words and you add to them to what Paul, other than what Paul was trying to say, what the Spirit was telling Paul to say in God's Word, you are basically doing what the Judaizers had been doing. And, and which was they were uncomfortable with the way the situation was. They were uncomfortable with the, the Gentiles coming into their world. And so they were trying to draw them back in. They were adding to the word that Paul had been preaching. And, and that's very dangerous to do. So, uh, again, I thought sorcery and, and this and drunkenness, I thought these two words were a great opportunity to, to be able to, to look at that, as, uh, that aspect. And then lastly, we look at the word orgies. Now, this one is also an interesting one. Uh, my, my translation says orgies. Some of you may say excessive feasting revelry or carousing um, these are very often associated with the words drunkenness and sensuality now many people believe that this word originally only meant a, a party or a banquet it didn't actually have any meaning beyond that but the problem was whenever you incorporate drunkenness excessive drinking 
those parties, as you kept drinking, would all of a sudden get worse and worse and worse that would then turn into sensuality. And then it would keep getting worse and worse and worse. And over time, a word that a Greek word that originally only meant a party or a banquet was then often associated with the aftermath of the party and the banquet whenever all the people would stumble out into the streets drunk and, you know, in other situations and making their way down the road. And they would often use the same word to that originally meant for the party, now means for the way they're acting after the fact. And so that a lot of people think that's kind of where that word came from, which I thought was a very interesting um, way of doing that. The point is, is that we are looking in the idea of excessiveness and, and taking this and, and riotous living. And, and I, I really like the right words, revelry and carousing. I think those are both good words to, to help to distinguish that. So the last part of verse 21 is, in my opinion, the most important part of this entire list, because it says two things. First of all, it says, and things like these. In other words, there's more to this list. This is not a summative list. This is not the finite, this is everything you need. If you just don't do these things, then you're fine. That's not what this is. In fact, that's not about just don't do these things and you're fine. The important thing is what Paul is about to say, where he says you need to do these things, which is the fruits of the Spirit. This is who you need to be. Stay away from that line uh, and get way over here. But it's important to know that there is more to this. There are more things that can lead us down a very destructive road. But the most important piece of this is the very end where he says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is nothing more powerful and more dangerous and more terrifying than that. And that this list, hopefully going through these words, gives you a little better understanding and a little better idea as to what these each one of these meant and, and kind of what Paul was getting at and how we can, we can stay away from those. And it's important to remember what Paul said prior to the list, which is through the Spirit that we can stay away from those things and they will guide us out of those temptations and lead us away from sin. Let me re- leave you with this. It says, of all the consequences that could befall the unfaithful, this one is surely the worst. Unrepentant sinners are forfeiting all the glories of heaven and eternal life in the presence of the Lord and his redeemed. Okay. It is important to remember we must stay as far away from those as we possibly can. And the Spirit, God, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, these will lead us in the way that we need to. Next week, we're going to be looking at a much better, uh, much more uplifting topic, which is going to be the fruits of the Spirit. And I challenge you to, uh, to try to read those without singing the song. I can't do it. So um, you know, we, will, we will finish that out. I, I was going to say, going back to the way you started, uh, not really started, but back in, in verse 16, and you know, use the words manifest, evident, depending on which version of the Bible, mm-hmm. the, you know, the works of the flesh are... are are evident. Mm-hmm. The whole idea here is that there, there. I mean, we, we all have examples of people we know in our lives that we see the way they live their life and we kind of worry about them. They do these mm-hmm. things every once in a while. They try to be good people. But the idea that this becomes the obvious pattern of somebody's life, mm-hmm. you know, and they just give into it is what you were saying in the yes. beginning. And I just, I just wanted to bring it back to that because living this way is living the opposite of what we're going to look at next week. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. If these things, as Paul said, and as you, you point out again, as these things, if they are manifest in your life or if they are evident in your life, um, then this is something you need to uh, be moving away from as quickly as you possibly can. And again, next week, we're going to be looking at what the Spirit gives us and the, the things the Spirit is going to, the, the type of ways that the Spirit is going to lead us, the type of life He's going to lead us into. So let's, uh, I hope you in, enjoyed the lesson this evening, or this morning, excuse me. This is an evening when I'm recording this. I apologize for that. But, uh, um, but I hope you enjoyed that and, uh, and hope you're able to get something out of it. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful world, Lord's Day uh, and this Sunday. So let's end with a very quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for all the blessings that you give us, everything that you do for us every single day. Lord, we want to uh, say thank you for everything that you do and everything that you have given us, especially in your Son and the Word uh, that the Holy Spirit uh, gave uh, to us, this truth that we have to live by. Lord, we ask that you give us strength, uh, help us to 
to use your spirit and to be able to use it in our lives, to be able to move past those temptations, to move around them, to get as far away from them as possible, to move past those sins, and to be able to encourage others to do the same and live a, a, a world, live in a world uh, in, around us that is uh, inspiring to those to be able to understand there is hope and there is uh, and to have faith in you. Lord, we uh, we say thank you for everything that you do uh, on this uh, this Mother's Day. We want to say thank you for all those um, out there that um, that are uh, have with their children that they have hopefully are raising in 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 a way to to glorify you. Uh, Lord, thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for your sons to His name. Amen.